Hey, good evening, everybody. Hope everybody's doing uh, well tonight. So we're getting ready to um, do our first lesson for the Linux Essentials Bootcamp. So hope you're all excited about that. Um, this evening, we've got a lot to, to go through. And uh, looks like we've got, uh, we're a couple minutes in. So, um, all right, so hopefully you can all see, um, see my screen uh, with our little, uh, uh, mascot Linux um, talks mascot, and that's what we'll be covering today is um, Linux essential. So hope that's the uh, lesson you were looking for tonight. And uh, why don't we get started? So just in terms of the uh, schedule, we will do a session uh, between seven and seven forty-five. Uh, we'll talk about some of the background of Linux for those of you who might not know it. Um, talk a little bit about what open source is, open source software, open source applications, because that's really what um, gave Linux its boost uh, and what differentiates Linux from um, some of the other operating systems that are out there. Um, so we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll take a short break from 7.45 to 8 o'clock, uh, give you guys a little bit of a breather, and then start up again at 8 through 8.45. This should be session two, of course another break and then we'll wrap it up from 9 to 10 or maybe 9 to 9 45 from what I can see. So um, anyway, three sessions with uh, two breaks in between. So uh, why don't we get started? So a few things we're going to be, um, uh, main topics we're going to be uh, covering tonight. Um, uh, first of all is uh, the evolution of Linux. And again, this is it's very important to um, understanding why Linux is as popular as it is, how it's gained such a stronghold, uh, not only uh, in the in enterprise, but also amongst uh, casual users. And, and to understand that, we really need to understand uh, how this, um, uh, this operating system came to be. Uh, we'll then look at um, uh, related to that major open source applications. Again, Linux is an open source free operating system. And we wanna talk a little bit about um, uh, on, on the related front applications such as um, uh, desktop applications, server applications, we'll look at programming languages and other things, but understand how that whole world um, is having an impact on, um, uh, on technology in general. And then we'll spend just a little bit of time talking about open soft, source software and licensing um, because uh, you know it is free, but um, there's still licenses and uh, terms and conditions to worry about. And I just wanna talk a little bit about that, a little bit of uh, legalese, not too much. Um, and then we'll get into a little bit of uh, hands-on fun. We'll look at um, uh, shell, what is shell? and do some uh, basic shell commands. And we'll look at some um, ways that you, if you want, this evening you can uh, try on your own machine if you don't already have it, to download um, a, a version of Linux and uh, work, get it working, and then follow along with me with some of these uh, basic uh, shell commands, all right? So that'll be the, the hands-on part of it towards the end. Um, so we don't get tired of looking at a presentation. All right, so if we look at the evolution of Linux, it really goes back um, to about 1985, which is now over 35 years ago. And it's been a long windy road, um, which has had a lot of uh, uh, implications uh, in the entire uh, technological world because Linux has influenced many, many corporations and individuals and the way they think about technology, the way they've implemented technology, the choices that they've made, um, uh, and you know that's some of the stuff we're going to look at. Um, so let's get right into it. So you know, to begin with, what is um, what is Linux? So Linux is a free and open source operating system, right? So three three key terms there: free, open source, and operating system. And we'll touch on each of those aspects of it. Now, some of you, um, I'm not sure uh, how much background you have or don't have in technology, but you know, we'll assume that um, uh, we'll just start from the baseline, uh, make sure everybody's on the same page. So um, you may or may not be familiar with what an operating system is, but all of you every day use operating systems, whether you know it or not. And 
two of the most common ones are Windows and iOS uh, or Android if you have an Android phone. So every time you're any on any sort of computing device, the thing that is running that device is the operating system at its very core. Um, and so that's really what a uh, an operating system is. If you think about the, the most simplistic uh, basic definition, an operating system is the core software that's required to make any computer functional. Um, and today, even the smallest devices are mini computers and require an operating system. So in fact, um, and, and many of those devices run uh, some form of, of Linux. And so Linux, Linux is actually everywhere. It's on your phones, on your TVs, um, your cars, for that matter. Um, it runs a good part of the internet. Uh, a lot of the uh, servers that uh, run the internet are running some version of the Linux operating system. Um, uh, stock exchanges around the world uh, run the uh, uh, Linux operating system. And part of the reason, um, I mean, there are many reasons for sure, but part of the reason that Linux has become so popular uh, is that because it's open source and many of the versions, the non-enterprise versions can be used at no cost. Uh, when you compare that to what it might cost to download and install uh, Windows, uh, you know, it's for sure much better to have a free uh, operating system. Um, so, you know, this, this slide um, goes back to uh, 2015 when we were celebrating 30 years of GNU Linux, and now uh, it's more than uh, 35 years. And as I mentioned, the, the um, uh, Linux dates back to um, about 1985 when a gentleman by the name of Richard Stallman created the Free Software Foundation uh, to, fun to fund his uh, GNU project. And this is one of the most important notes to take away um, about Linux, um, in that it was born from the spirit of making software available for free, right? That's kind of the genesis of it, which is very different than Microsoft, which is very different than Apple. Um, and while those two uh, companies also created operating systems that are quite popular today, um, um, it, the driver for Linux was something very different. Um, and so the founder of the Linux kernel, who we saw in the, that previous video, uh, Linus Torvalds, uh, released the first version of Linux in 1991, the first version of the Linux kernel in 1991. <clears throat> and then in 1992, he licensed that Linux kernel under the GNU free license. As I mentioned, even though we have open, so uh, open source, it is governed by licenses and um, there are certain agreements that you make um, when you use this software, when you distribute the software, and we'll be talking more about that. But he, he licensed it uh, under the GNU free license. Um, and then if you look uh, further along in this timeline, you can see other Linux distributions um, and Linux based OSs released over the years. So in 1993, we have Debian. In 2004, we have Ubuntu. And then uh, in 2008, uh, Android, which is, uh, by the way, Linux-based, if you didn't know that. And then, of course, we can't forget that Tux, the Linux mascot, uh, came into existence in 1996. So a couple of other things uh, to note that um, uh, enterprise Linux really started to take off in 1998, which you see uh, sort of at the top of the screen, about halfway, uh, when, um, uh, 24 by 7 support started being delivered. And this is what sometimes differentiates enterprise Linux from some of the free versions of Linux because, you know, it's bundled with um, support. And, um, you know, this is really important for, for companies. And then if you look um, in 2012, you see Raspberry Pi was introduced, which was uh, made to, uh, uh, was introduced to make embedded Linux more accessible. In fact, in just three years, uh, 5 million units were sold. So it's really a mini, uh, mini computer running a version of uh, Linux called Raspberry Pi OS. Uh, and we'll talk about embedded systems a little bit as well um, uh, in a few slides. But you can see a lot has happened um, over the years with Linux. And um, Linus, in fact, uh, not only invented um, 
or created, I should say, uh, the Linux kernel. But you see, you can see in 2013, uh, he also uh, developed Git, which some of you may know or you may not know, but it's a repository um, that uh, teams use in order to, to work together on software projects so they can put all their software in uh, a certain location, they can all access it and share it. And it's one of the most popular um, repositories um, anywhere. And so, you know, it was another creation of his. And again, you go back to his personality and see, you know, somebody who's really focused on his work and, you know, not having a lot of distractions uh, and just looking to be innovative and, and solve problems um, to help people. All right, so what, um, you know, what are the components of Linux? And we're gonna talk about uh, specifically, of course, Linux here because that's what the uh, topic is for today. But um, most operating systems have very analogous components. They're gonna be maybe slightly different, slightly different names, but essentially when you look at an operating system, <clears throat> um, it's gonna structurally look very similar. And so if we look at the components, first of all, you realize or, or notice that they're all sitting on top of the hardware or the computer. So if you picked up this, um, you know, went to Best Buy or, uh, you know, wherever it is you get your computers and you pick it up and there's no operating system, that's all you have. You have the hardware, you have the motherboard, and the memory chips inside and, um, uh, you know, whatever other hardware is associated with it. Um, um, that's it. And so you have the, the operating system that sits on top of it. And um, the first uh, component is the bootloader. And many of you have heard that uh, terminology before um, that the computer needs to, be, needs to boot or it needs to reboot. But the bootloader is essentially managing that, that boot process where it's uh, validating all of the different um, uh, components that are part of, you know, on the, on the motherboard and, you know, checking to make sure everything is, is responding properly. And most of the time for an end user, that's just a splash screen. That's all you see. But you know, there's a lot going on in the background um, to actually boot the, the operating system. Uh, and then on top of the bootloader, you have really the, the crux of the operating system, which is known as the kernel. You know, every operating system has its kernel. And in fact, the Linux kernel is what gave the Linux operating system its name. Um, so what uh, what was developed in 1991 was was this kernel, and then you have to have all these components around it. Uh, but the kernel then sits on top of the the bootloader, and what it does is really manage the operating systems, um, the the core of the operating system. It manages the CPU, memory, as well as peripheral devices. So you know, to make sure that the, the uh, CPU is used by applications and processes um, in an orderly fashion, make sure that memory is distributed to these applications in an orderly fashion, that there aren't different applications fighting for that same memory. And to us, when we're using these operating, system, operating systems, it seems also easy and uh, natural, but underneath at the kernel level, um, you know, all of that has to be managed so that, you know, applications aren't uh, stepping off over each other, fighting for um, these resources. And then on top of the kernel, you have the uh, GNU core uh, utilities, and that contains most of the basic tools and commands um, that are used in the operating system. And, you know, when we, when we do the hands-on session towards um, the latter half of uh, this evening's uh, class, we'll get into some of those uh, utilities and, and see what they do and, you know, how they help us. And then for, for any operating system, there has to be some way to handle input devices, right? How do I know what letter I just typed in or where the mouse is? Um, uh, you know, in, in some cases you have a touch screen. In some cases you have these um, uh, pads with, with, uh, uh, that you're, you know, write with, with a, with a pen. Um, so all of those are input devices. And, you know, how does the operating system know what's being input to the system in order to be able to pass it to uh, one of the applications. Well, at that level, um, there's the X server for Linux, which is that component of the operating system, which is handling uh, all of the input devices. 
And then you have the uh, graphical interface, and you know that's what uh, most of the users are are interacting with. And there are different kinds of interfaces. There are uh, you know command line interfaces. There are more graphical interfaces. Um, lots of different um, uh, options available. Again, depends on um, you know what you like, what kind of system you have. You know there are a lot of people who just love to to work on the uh, uh, kind of on the terminals, um, and aren't so fascinated by uh, the uh, kind of Windows type environment, the graphical environments. And so, you know, you, you, but in any case, whatever whatever that interface is, you need to have some uh, kind of a graphical interface. <clears throat> and then finally, you have what everybody is really buying the computer for, for the applications, right? Um, you're gonna have lots of different applications, as you know, today, you know, applications are known as apps. You know, we talk about apps on a phone, um, but applications on a on a uh, computer. You know, you can have things like Microsoft Word if you're doing, or you know, these Office productivity tools. You can have programming languages. You can have games. You know, lots and lots of different uh, applications. And ultimately, when you think about it, that's why we buy computers. That's why we have computers um, for these applications. And, and in order for those applications to work all those different components have to exist um, um, as part of the operating system in order to um, you know to get input from you uh, process that input be able to get resources from the the hardware and use those resources to do the com computations and, uh, and and whatever else the application needs okay so like i said this these are the components uh, at a high level of linux but if you were to look at any operating system you would find very, very similar um, components um, uh, because this is really what you need to run uh, run a, a, a computer. So one of the things that um, is, I think, different than than uh, some of the more popular operating systems that you know of, uh, in other words, iOS, um, Mac OS, um, Windows, you know, they have kind of a current version, the latest version of uh, of their operating system. And you're either running the current version or maybe you're a couple of versions behind, but there's really only one flavor of um, the operating system. Maybe a couple of Windows has uh, a user interface, a, a full version, if you will, and they have something called core, and the core is, uh, doesn't have the Windows interface. Um, but Linux, on the other hand, has many, 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 many distributions. In fact, more than 100 distributions. Um, and you can think of a distribution as a different flavor. Um, uh, you can say a different version, but I think it's it's more than just a version. Um, it's a whole, um, yeah, a whole different flavor of of um, uh, of the, the of the operating system. And most of these distributions were created for a particular reason or somebody had a uh, you know, particular goal in mind. And so they started uh, working with uh, the base version of Linux and then they developed on top of it. And again, I'm gonna come back to this a few times during this, this, uh, this class, but one of the key things about um, or differentiators about Linux is that it is open source. Because it is open source, you can get the source code and we're going to talk about what source code is and, and what it means but you can get the, the source code you can get the starting point uh for the linux operating system all those components that we just talked about and you can build your own version so you know anybody out there who has an aspiration to you know work on an operating system you can go out and get the operating the, the source code and build a version of linux uh, of your own um, and, and because of that, that's another reason why you have so many flavors, because you have all of these, um, you know, different people or organizations or companies who, for whatever reason, they say, hey, look, this is a nice core to start, start from, but I want something that does this, or I want something that does, that's more focused on that, or I want to do something a little bit different than, than what uh, the current flavors of Linux are, um, uh, are giving me. Um, and so, you know, you have all of these different flavors. And, you know, so we can start with um, uh, Debian, which uh, is designed to be, um, I would say, a more powerful compute platform. 
um, that's designed to run on different types of hardware, especially for development. Um, so one of the things about operating systems is that, you know, they have to be compatible with um, uh, the hardware that they're running on, right? Uh, for some of you who might have run Windows um, a little while ago, you know, every time you, uh, you know, you change some piece of hardware, you had to download a, a device driver for it or you had to tell it it's got, you've got this new uh, hardware and it would have to update itself. And so, you know, the operating system while it's running on, uh, or not while, but because it's running on top of a cer certain type of hardware, specific hardware, it has to be um, crafted um, to allow all of that hardware to operate properly. And um, so Debian was uh, one of these things where they wanted a, a more powerful compute platform um, that was going to run on different types of um, hardware. Now Ubuntu um, is based on Debian, in fact, and it's one of the most popular distributions of uh, Linux. And I would say um, it's really geared towards, or, or the, the user base that you see with on, on Ubuntu are people who are just starting out with Linux. Um, so relatively easy to use, easy to get, um, and you'll see a lot of people who want to start out with, with uh, Linux are um, uh, using uh, Ubuntu. And in fact, when we get to the hands-on session, I will show you again that uh, you can actually download an Ubuntu, a version of Ubuntu for Windows on your uh, Windows machines, for those of you who are using Windows. And I'll show you my installation, and you can actually run uh, Linux there if you want to get some practice. Uh, there's also Linux Mint, and that's more of a community-driven um, uh, uh, distribution. And again, uh, based on Debian. Um, it was designed, I would say, to be both powerful as well as uh, more easy to use. And then you have Manjaro, which is based on something called uh, Arch Linux. And uh, the focus of this distribution is to help um, users get started quickly. Um, it's got more automated tools uh, and requires less manual intervention. Um, and there's more help available when needed. Then we have uh, OpenSUSE, which is uh, financially backed by uh, the German company um, uh, SUSE. And so SUSE was really developed for enterprises and it's a paid um, version of Linux, but OpenSUSE is the uh, open source counterpart for that. And it's really designed for desktop users and there are two different versions uh, that desktop users can get access to. Then you have two, uh, two of the flavors or distributions that are uh, widely, widely popular in enterprises. Um, and the first one is Red Hat. So you have Red Hat Enterprise Linux, or sometimes you'll hear it called as REL, um, R-H-E-L. Um, and that's a very popular uh, distribution of Linux, as I said, for, for businesses. Um, and it's gonna work well, whether you're running it on desktops, on servers, on hypervisors, um, you know, for those of you who have been working in the cloud, um, you know, I do a lot of work in AWS and, you know, it's a very popular operating system to be running uh, in the cloud as well. So Fedora, uh, which is the last um, distribution I want to touch on right now, is actually owned by Red Hat and it's the community supported counterpart for, for RHEL. Um, so again, RHEL is kind of the paid enterprise version and Fedora is the community version. And the, the uh, aspect that, that separates Fedora from RHEL and from some of these other distributions is that their objective or its objective is stated to be that they want to be on the cutting edge of development. And really the first uh, Linux distribution to integrate um, any new technologies or any new features, and they want to stay ahead of the game, you know, and it's kind of a, a, um, a benefit, in fact, to, to Red Hat, uh, because they can, you know, take some of the benefits that, that you gain from some of this advanced research and bake it into um, uh, RHEL or Red Hat Enterprise Linux, okay? So that gives you a, a little bit of sense of, of the, the background of Linux, where it came from. You know, that leads directly to the fact that there, there's so many distributions of it because it was uh, based on, you know, because it's free, because it's open source. 
Um, and then, you know, we can jump next into talk about uh, uh, Linux embedded systems. So some of the distributions that we've been talking about uh, and when I mentioned them and I, I explained them, I talked about the fact that they run on servers, that they run on desktops, in the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look around you today and you don't have to look too far, just look around the room that you're in, um, embedded systems are everywhere. Uh, an, embed system, an embedded system is actually just a miniature computer uh, that it's built into a larger system and that embedded system has some very spe specific functions to accomplish. So if you look around, you know, it, it's in, the embedded systems are in your cars. If you've flown recently, they're all over airplanes. You've got a printer in your printers, definitely in your TVs. Your smart TVs aren't smart just by themselves. They're smart because they've got these embedded systems. Your Wi-Fi routers, uh, your, your um, uh, refrigerators, your thermostats nowadays, uh, I mean, you name it, and it's got an embedded um, system. And because an embedded system is essentially a computer system, what does it need to run? Well, it needs an operating system. And um, the operating system and the kernel to uh, function properly. Now, you could run any operating system, really, right? But if you are a manufacturer of a... Um, embedded system like this, and you had an option to buy, let's say, um, or to install a lightweight Microsoft operating system or a lightweight uh, Mac-based uh, OS or you know, Apple-based OS, iOS, which you had to pay through the nose for, or you had the option to just embed a free operating system, which one would you probably choose, right? And so that's another reason why we're starting to see Linux um, take more and more of a stronghold in the marketplace because as these embedded systems start to proliferate, as more and more devices become smarter, um, you know, uh, Linux is an ideal choice for that uh, because you can, first of all, uh, get access to that source code, get a lightweight version of Linux. And if you need to pare it down even further, or if you need to put some specific fun functionality on it, uh, then you can certainly do that. And so, as I mentioned at the um, uh, during the early part of the, the presentation, that uh, the Raspberry Pi mini computer um, is in fact an embedded system. It uses the Raspberry Pi OS, uh, which itself is based on Debian. All right. So we're really taking the the Linux operating system, paring it down or pruning out some of the stuff that you don't need. Um, I mean, you're not going to have a printer necessarily connected to a fridge. And so all the stuff that runs the printer, you don't necessarily need. Um, you know, and so there's stuff like that you can prune out that you, you might not need in a particular situation, but uh, you can use the core uh, components. Uh, and then uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Android uh, OS is also based on uh, Linux. So you can look at that as, um, you know, a, a kind of uh, embedded version of, of Linux. I'm gonna actually pause there for a minute. I don't know if normally there are questions, but uh, I just wanna check, are there uh, any questions from, from anybody uh, about anything that I've said so far before I continue? No? Okay. All right, so let's go on. So. Uh, let's continue down this theme of open source. So we're here talking about Linux. Um, and one of the key <clears throat> uh, attributes or one of the key uh, features of Linux is the fact that it's open source. So let's, let's look at uh, open source in a little more depth. And we're going to start by uh, looking at uh, applications. But we'll also take a look at you know, some development languages, um, uh, something called a package management tool that are open source, just to kind of give you a glimpse. You know, you might have seen a lot of these and not know they're open source, but just to realize that, you know, that this open source community is huge. Um, you know, there's a lot of innovation that comes out of there. And, um, you know, these are things that will start to be, um, uh, start to show up in your, or if they've not, if they haven't already, start to show up in your day-to-day -day, uh, lives. 
but as I said, we have various different kinds of applications we can talk about. Um, so let's start with the desktop application. So uh, what is a desktop application? Um, simply put, it's an application that you're going to install and run on your computer um, that you're that's ready to use for some business or personal use by itself. So it stands independently. It has some function. Um, it's not necessarily going to create something, um, uh, another uh, piece of software, but it's doing something that you found, find um, useful or have some use for. And many of you may already be using uh, the Mozilla Firefox browser. In fact, I use it um, quite a bit. I use a couple of different ones, but one of the ones that I use is Mozilla Firefox. And it's a very uh, feature rich uh, browser. I mean, it can compete, uh, or in fact, it's better than some of the other browsers for which you know um, you might have to pay. And in fact, this was introduced back in 2004 and uh, has grown to be one of the leading browsers today, like I said, with uh, a lot of different uh, and robust functionality. And now we come to Thunderbird. Now, a lot of you um, are using or might be using Microsoft Outlook, uh, Outlook for uh, a mail client or for calendaring. Well, Thunderbird is just an open source mail and calendar client uh, that can be used for exactly that same purpose. Um, it's relatively easy to set up. Um, and of course, it comes at no cost. And so again, um, you know, companies like Microsoft somehow find their find a way to, um, uh, you know, get employees to to use the Outlook tool for free, and then you know they end up cha charging the the cut. You know, these large uh, companies a lot for it. But if you're you know looking for a tool just for yourself, um, and you don't want to spend a lot of money, you don't necessarily want something that's a web application because some of the tools that use for mail and calendars are actually web applications. So you have to log into the web to get access to them. Um, and like I said, here we're talking about desktop applications. So, <clears throat> you know, Thunderbird is something that you might want to um, uh, think about. Uh, and then uh, LibreOffice. Uh, this is something, in fact, I used not too long ago and I don't remember exactly why I was using it, but um, I had some need for, um, for it. And essentially it's an office productivity suite. So you can compare this to uh, Microsoft Office. And the reason I don't compare it, for example, to um, uh, you know, Google Docs or uh, Google Apps or anything like that is because again, this is a, uh, we're talking about desktop applications, things that you actually install on your desktop. So LibreOffice has a word processor. It's got a spreadsheet application. Uh, it's got an application that allows you to build presentations, um, to work with graphics, um, and a few other things. So again, a good alternative if you don't want to pay for uh, commercial versions like Microsoft Office or others. And then um, you have GIMP, uh, which is a free software that's going to help with image processing, uh, such as retouching and creating images. So a lot of people, you know, uh, talk about Adobe and Photoshop and you know some of these more popular packages, but you know just so you know there are free and open source applications out there um, uh, in this community that is very much um, behind making software available uh, for free to uh, end users. All right, so we talked about uh, uh, desktop applications. How about um, server applications? So a desktop application that I said, if you have your computer, you install it, you're running it. Um, it doesn't necessarily need access to the internet, although sometimes it helps. Um, a server application, on the other hand, runs on a different computer. So it runs on a server. You can think of a server, if you're not familiar with one already, as uh, just a more powerful computer that's not your laptop. You know, it's running somewhere else. Um, sometimes it runs in the cloud. Sometimes it runs in a company's data center. Sometimes in a company's, um, uh, you know, off, not, not necessarily office environment, but in a, in a, in a cabinet somewhere, a hardware cabinet. Um, and so unlike the desktop applications, these are going to run on central servers. 
and they're going to communicate with external clients to um, accomplish certain tasks. So this is where this notion, maybe some of you have heard of it before, this notion of client server applications came in. You have a server and you have a client, the client makes a request of the server, the server does something and then gets the information back to the client. Think about it as, a, as, as though, um, you know, when you're in a restaurant, when you're in a restaurant, you wanna order food, you don't just run back into the kitchen and start cooking it by yourself. Um, but you make a request, you look at the menu, you know what's available, you know exactly what to ask for. So you ask the server, you know, I want this, that, or the other thing. Um, he or she goes back, talks to the chef, or it puts the order in, and then your order comes back to you. So it's the same kind of thing. You have a client of a server and there's a, a specific language that they speak to each other. They know what's on the menu uh, and they can order only things that are on the menu. And then in the back end, there's a chef who knows exactly how to put all of this together and then return it. So that's what a, what a server, uh, how a client server application works. And so one of the most popular um, uh, server applications, free uh, open source, is a, the Apache web server. Um, now, if you don't know, uh, a, a web server is what is used to actually run a website. Um, so in order to run a website, a company has to install a server. Uh, they have to install a physical uh, a hardware server. They have to then install a web server application. In this case, they would install Apache. And then you have clients. And what are the clients with a web server? Well, the clients are browsers. So the, the browser makes a request of the, the server and then the server does whatever it has to do. If you're on an e-commerce site, it you know looks up the, the items um, and then returns the items. But Apache is an open source free web server that can host uh, HTTP based websites. Um, and it's popular because it can support multiple programming languages um, uh, as well as it allows for user sign-in and uh, most importantly, it supports uh, databases. So I'm gonna pause right there. We're at 7.45, which is the time for our break. So if you want to go grab yourself a drink or use the restroom or some food, whatever you need to do, why don't you do that? And we'll come back and continue on server applications and talk about, uh, continue with the discussion on NGINX. All right, so this little penguin tells me that we'll get started in another minute. So grab your seats, fasten your seat belts, and we'll get into hour two of uh, Linux. All right, there we are. Let's go back to where we were, server applications. So we talked about desktop applications. Um, these are things you're gonna install on your desktop. They're gonna run on your desktop servers, Applications are gonna be installed remotely. Um, we talked about Apache as a web server uh, and a web server is required to run uh, a website or a web application, if you will. Uh, mostly every application that you're running out there um, uh, over the web, actually every application you're running out there over the web has a some kind of web server. So Apache is a, a very, very popular um, uh, web server and it's open source free. And then another good example is uh, NGINX uh, and that's also a, a web server. Um, the other thing about NGINX, it can be used for more network intensive activities uh, like media streaming and a reverse proxy and some other things, but uh, basically another good um, web server. Some of you may realize that almost every application uh, web application or otherwise requires a database to store information, right? So any site you go to that's, um, uh, you know, where you're, you're, you're doing something where they're storing information, the data is stored in a database and databases can be very, very expensive. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and sometimes you'll hit millions of dollars. However, um, there are some databases, most notably MySQL, uh, which are open source, uh, which are uh, very robust and in fact, widely used. Um, and it's so widely used that MySQL actually forms part of what's called a LAMP or LAMP, a LAMP stack. So when you put together Linux, Apache, 
MySQL and PHP. And we'll talk about PHP in a little bit. So when you put together those four, you get LAMP. And so LAMP, app, LAMP stack applications are quite popular. Um, and the back end, if you will, or the database is MySQL. And MySQL is a open source database. And, and, and a number of other databases were created um, uh, from MySQL, including MariaDB, as well as Aurora in AWS. The other application that's worth mentioning uh, is Samba, which is um, an application that bridges the gap between Linux and Windows. Um, it runs on Linux platforms, but it's able to communicate with Windows uh, as a native application. And it can be used for um, file and print servers, as well as identity and access management to uh, authenticate as well as authorize users. And then there's um, an interesting application called uh, Own Cloud, which is essentially um, uh, an application that can be used for file hosting. So think of it as your own personal Dropbox. And again, just to, to put a, a, a point on this, uh, that all of these are open source. So anybody has access to the source code and you can go and take it and mold it, um, update it, do whatever you want to make it your own. Um, if you have some particular need to do that. The other set of um, open source or, or category of open source uh, applications that we should talk about are um, development languages. Uh, these are essentially applications, uh, but they are tools more so that allow you to create software um, using well-defined structured languages. Um, so if we start with Shell, uh, this is a language interpreter, and we're going to get more, uh, into a lot more detail uh, with Shell, um, uh, probably towards the latter part of this uh, class, and we'll start um, creating some Shell scripts, uh, not Shell scripts, we'll run some Shell commands um, and see how that works. But, you know, you can uh, write scripts in Linux, and you can write, you know, essentially programs uh, with um, Shell. And the most popular uh, implementation of shell is called uh, bash, the born again um, shell, B-O-U-R-N-E, not B-O-R-N-E, not B-O-R-N, the born again um, shell. So that's one of the most popular shells. Um, and you'll see that across, um, you know, lots of li different Linux uh, distributions. And then there are a lot of different programming languages. And these are used by uh, companies everywhere. So, you know, if you think about some of the most uh, um, popular software that's out there, the software that you use every single day is likely built with one of these languages. And, you know, we can start with the C programming language, which was, uh, which has been in use since, oh, um, probably the 1970s. And it can be used um, to develop code on Windows, on Linux, on Mac OS. Um, and then we have Java, which uh, really uh, came to be around 1995. Uh, it was developed by Sun Microsystems. And Java also runs like, uh, like uh, C on various platforms, Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. The huge advantage that you have with Java is that the output that's created is platform independent. It runs on a uh, what's known as a Java virtual machine. And so it doesn't matter where that whether that Java virtual machine is running on Windows or Mac or um, you know whatever whatever operating system, um, uh, you can create the same software. And then we have some uh, uh, we have something called JavaScript, which sometimes people confuse with Java, but they're just two different languages, um, maybe with some similarities, but they're they're different languages. And uh, JavaScript is really used more for front end development for web applications. It, it really um, it's designed to run code on a web browser to make your web applications uh, dynamic um, and be able to process um, uh, you know, in various kinds of input of information or you know, um, uh, interface with different components or different uh, websites. But otherwise, without um, you know, any sort of scripting on the front end, you would just have plain HTML, which would just be you know, very much a static website. Then Perl is another oldie and a goldie. Um, 
Perl has been used for over thir uh, 30 years um, on various different pla uh, platforms. Uh, Python is pretty much uh, very much the new kid on the block. Uh, it's a newer language uh, that's gaining uh, 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 wide amounts of popularity and um, significant adoption. It's actually quite easy to uh, pick up compared to some of the other languages. Um, I think it's um, it lacks in some functionality um, and capabilities compared to others. But when you look at the trade-off, um, you know it's really uh, an easy language to pick up. It's a fun language to use, and at the end of the day, very powerful. And then PHP is another old um, older language, uh, really used more for scripting, and it was um, you know used for a lot of web development. And you know, while these languages are very different um, and used for different reasons and different purposes, the commonality between them, again, is what? Is that they're all open source. So again, you can see the influence that the open source community has had um, on enterprise and, and enterprise software. All right, so um, the last uh, category of tools we're gonna look, uh, look at um, are package management tools. Now, package management tools are um, uh, more common uh, and used in uh, the Linux environment. So, um, uh, when you when you look at software in Linux, it's actually available to you through pre-compiled packages. And then the way you install them is you run these uh, package managers. And there are a lot of different package managers. Um, so if you run Windows or if you run Mac, uh, you know there's very few, there's a couple of ways to install software. You have these MSI packages for Windows, or you know you get a Mac um, uh, installation package. With Linux, it really depends on what flavor of Linux you're using. So some of the, the popular or popular uh, package management tools are Yum, uh, and Yum will run on Red Hat, Fedora, and uh, variations of, of uh, Red Hat and Fedora. And then you have something uh, called AppGet, which will run on Ubuntu and Debian and operating systems um, in that family. All right. Okay, I'm gonna pause again. Maybe some of you got some energy after the break, but any, uh, uh, any questions? jump over that break because we already had it any questions going once twice i i have one small question yes yes i read about it and i listened in right now but i couldn't quite understand what is the package management is it like when we download the application or program it comes with the package with lots of um extension and we use like zip or some other application to open it and use it. Is that the packaging we're talking about? So the, yeah, and in fact, um, since you're asking, when we get to the hands-on section, I will I will show you. But essentially, a package manager is the thing that installs the software. So you can think of the package as the as the um, it it could be like it's it's pretty much a, a compressed file. It's like a zip file, and then the package manager. Uh, basically can, um, does a lot of, it does a few different things. So one, it will extract all the, the, the contents, but the package manager also has to understand all the dependencies. So, you know, when you install one piece of software, there are other dependencies. And so the software um, package manager has to install the other pieces of software that it's dependent on. Um, or, um, you know, sometimes a package manager will update the, um, um, you know, all the packages at once, all the software applications at once, once. So you can think of it as the installer. That's probably the best way to look at it. It's the installer of the software. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Good. Great. Love questions. Um, okay. Open soft, uh, open source software and licensing. So um, we've seen lots of examples. We started talking about Linux. Uh, and we talked about the fact that one of the differentiating characteristics is that it's open source and it's free. That's what's um, uh, driven its popularity. And then we talked about um, uh, open source applications and different types of applications. But 
what is it? What does that mean exactly? What is um, uh, what does it mean to be open source? Um, so let's dig a dig a little bit deeper into that definition, um, and then talk a little bit about licensing, um, and then a couple of organizations that support open source, uh, FSF and OSI, Free Software Foundation, and Open Systems Inc. So we'll we'll talk about um, uh, those. Uh, sorry, open source initiative. Um, so let's talk about um, open source first. So what is open source software? Uh, so open source, open source software is um, software with source code that anyone can inspect, modify, and enhance. Okay, Source code that anyone can inspect, modify, and enhance. So some of you might know what source code is already. Um, but if you don't, source code is or is the is the instructions, the set of instructions that are written uh, in a specific language. So we talked about the different languages that you had. Um, so it's all of the instructions that are written in that particular language that tell the software what to do. And then that source code gets turned into machine code. And then that machine code is what's really understood by the uh, operating system and the, and the hardware, it's run on the hardware. And so that source code, when you have it, you're able to tell it to do something different. So let, let's take a really simple example here. Um, I want to uh, have a blue screen, okay? Um, so I write a program and I say, okay, put a, a and I, I write the source code and I say, paint the screen blue and um, I create the machine code and I run that software. And now on my screen, I see a blue square. And I think, oh, that's wonderful. I'm gonna send it to all my friends. So I send it to everybody who's listening to um, uh, on the bootcamp and you all run it and you say, oh, that's wow, that's wonderful. Except, you know, uh, half of you decide that you prefer something that would be green. Well, how do you get it to be green? Well, you can't because what I've given you is just, just the machine code. The machine only understands how to paint it blue. In order for you, me, in order for you to have your screen go green, you could tell me, uh, hey, can you, um, can you paint the, change it to green? And I would change the source code, I would recreate the machine code and I'd ship you a green uh, screen. Or, or I could just send you, send you the source code and you can make it green. And they might, you might say, oh, well, I don't want it just, I just don't want it to be green. I want it to change color every five minutes. Oh, I don't want it to just change color. I want it to show a picture. And all of a sudden from my blue screen, you get a screensaver. And that's exactly how open source works. Somebody has an idea, they develop it, they make it available to other people. Other people take it, they modify it, modify it, modify it. All of a sudden now you've got um, you know, this great piece of software, which, you know, the original author may not have intended, but um, it's kind of this contribution uh, engine um, that helps build great software. So open source software is uh, software where that source co code is available for free for um, anyone to make changes. Now, most companies, most profit making companies um, uh, and those companies that develop applications, their source code is one of the most valuable assets which they guard very, very closely, right? So, you know, you're not going to find the source code for the Windows operating system um, anywhere anytime soon, or, you know, the source code for Zoom or, you know, anything like that. So, you know, it's a, it's a very valuable asset. And the fact that this open source community exists and you have people driven by, you know, lots of different factors. And sometimes I'm not sure I fully even understand, but um, they're driven by the fact that they want, um, you know, great software out there and they want people to be able to build great things. Um, and, and so even though um, open source software is free, um, it still comes with terms and conditions. Um, uh, if you're going to use open source software, you have to abide by, um, certain uh, uh, rules and regulations, and it comes in the form of uh, licenses, okay? 
Um, and there are existing licenses which you can leverage to distribute um, your software. And we'll see a list of those licenses. And some of those you may know about, you may have seen them and wondered, hey, what is, what is this GNU license that's um, listed every time I start this software? Um, and so, you know, there's some, some very popular licenses that people have created and then others as they develop uh, their, open, their own open source software, they distribute their software under the same terms and conditions as some of these licenses that were already created. So you can think of a license like that as like a template, right? As a contract template. Um, uh, somebody's already developed a template. I like it. It makes sense. This is what how I want somebody to use my license. So here, this is open source, and here's the way you can use it. So there are two categories primarily of um, licenses. There's something called a permissive license, and there's something called a copyleft license. So a permissive license, and, and essentially both licenses allow you to you or or um, let you use the software at your own risk. That means as is. Um, if there's some defect in the software that causes, you know, your computer to blow up, well, then, you know, that's not the fault of the person who wrote the software. It's at your own risk. Um, you know, so you have to take on that liability. And you can, and, and a permissive license allows you to use the code at your own risk um, as long as you abide by the requirements for attribution. Uh, An attribution just means that you acknowledge that you got this software from somebody or somewhere, and you say, you know, this is based on whatever the source, the, the source, the, the code that this person or this organization um, developed. So that's a, a permissive license. Then you have something called a copyleft license, and a copyleft license has the same um, stipulations as a permissive license. But on top of that, it requires that you uh, provide the source code for any software you release. So under permissive license, I can just rebuild the software or I can modify the software. I can actually build the machine code for it, release the machine code, and that's it. I don't have to do anything else. But with a copyleft license, I can build that machine code, but I also have to release the, the source code for it. Okay. And um, you know, you have to abide by, uh, you know, by those rules if you want to use this uh, open source software. So here are some of the um, uh, licenses. And again, you may be familiar with some of them. You know, the MIT license is quite familiar, uh, quite common, sorry. Uh, the Apache license, the GNU public, general public license. So, you know, these may be familiar, maybe not, but, you know, next time you see them, uh, you'll know why they're listed like that. They they um, um, they tell you how the software is being released and under uh, what type of license. So a uh, um, couple of organizations that I want to just uh, mention and talk about because they really promote um, this culture of open source. Um, and so the first is the uh, uh, FSF or the Free Software Foundation. And their mission is to promote uh, computer user freedom. Um, um, you know, these, uh, this organization is, is, I would say more, uh, you know, very, very much advocates um, and trying to go against the establishment, if you will, you know, uh, against big corporations making uh, lots of money with, uh, with software and they're kind of anti-establishment, if you will, but they use exclusively free software to perform their work. Um, and as I said, their mission is to promote um, uh, freedom for computer users. The other one is the um, uh, Open Source Initiative or OSI, again, a nonprofit organization, and they're dedicated to the promotion of open, soft, uh, open source software. Um, they were founded in 1998. Um, and they're less of a anti-establishment organization and more about um, kind of promoting, um, uh, uh, kind of building up the open source community, uh, public advocacy, um, education, but you know, two organizations that are really pushing forward um, uh, this notion of, of, of open source. Okay. And again, just to, to remind you, the reason we went down this track on, on open source is because it's, it really, 
um, is the undercurrent, is the fabric around which um, Linux was born and um, uh, how it's gained its popularity. All right, so uh, let's shift gears a bit. Um, uh, we'll do a little, uh, we'll start a little bit light on the hands-on and then I think in the next session, so when, when we come back after the next break, we'll do a little bit more um, you know, heavy duty hands-on. Maybe you get a chance, I'll show you how to download uh, a Linux platform if you'd like and you can follow along um, just so you can, um, you know, not just watch on screen, but actually do it. Okay, so um, Linux, how do you use Linux? Well, we talked about Linux um, uh, available on, on uh, workstations, Linux available on servers, Linux available on, on um, uh, embedded systems. Well, how about Linux available on Windows, okay. So I'm going to, for a minute, I'm going to switch my windows here. All right, so just bear with me. I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second. I need to switch my windows because I wanna, um, I wanna give you the opportunity to, to even try this if you'd like or um, see how it works. I need to move this here. Okay, now I can share my screen again. All right, good. So hopefully you all see my um, uh, my screen here. Okay, so this is the window, window, the Linux subsystem on Windows. So you see the um, the graphic here, but let me show you and. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are on Windows, but I see 38 people on the call, so roughly 40 people on the call. Um, I would imagine at least a good 50% of you, if not more, are running Windows, and maybe the other half are running Mac, maybe a little bit less. But let me go to the Start menu here. I will go to, um, just type in Store. I will go to the Microsoft Store. And you can do this now, you can do this at the break, um, whenever you want, if you want, you don't have to. Um, but if you'd like, it's just um, might be more useful than just watching when I do the hands-on. So I'm gonna just search for Linux here. And very slowly it should come back. I don't know why it's taking so long today or right now. Go back, let's try it again. Okay, so uh, it comes back with all kinds of flavors of Linux, right? We, we talked about how many distributions? Over 100 distributions, right? So here's OpenSUSE, um, here's Ubuntu. Uh, we have SUSE itself. Uh, Debian, which again is a, um, or, or sorry, Ubuntu is an offshoot of Debian. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, you'll notice you don't see Red Hat here, right? Because it's an enterprise version. Um, what else? What other? Okay, so a few different. Um, a few different releases. So let me let me get. Uh, Open SUSE. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to select it. Uh, 15.3. Let me get the latest version. So I'm just going to select it. And you can really for for the for our purposes, you can really use uh, any version of Linux that you want. Ubuntu would be a good one. Um, uh, Debian, if you want, try. Open Susie. No, I don't want it. Okay, something is not right. Oh, it's downloading. Okay, so this is going to take a little bit of time to download. And so that's why I was saying you can start it now. But you can see I just go to the Microsoft Store and I have access to all of these different um, uh, 
versions of Linux, though. So the Windows, sorry, the, the Linux subsystem on Windows. So in fact, I have previously installed, um, as you can say, see uh, Debian, but I also have Ubuntu, right? And so you run Ubuntu. And if you're not familiar with the, um, with what the Linux UI might look like, um, you can see it right there. Um, might be too small. Let me, you know, and we'll get into running some commands. But now I'm in Linux all of a sudden. Um, you know, I can run all kinds of Linux commands. And we'll do this, by the way. We'll, we'll do all these commands and we'll talk about what they mean um, and how they work. And I was talking about um, shell, right? So I've got a bunch of shell scripts here. So uh, let's see here. Um, you know, for example, what's this cars.sh? We were doing another class before, so let me just look at this file cars.sh, and we can look at that. Uh, if we have some time towards the end of the class, I, I know we have some, I baked some time in to do some hands on stuff, but not scripting. But if we have some time, we'll uh, go through some scripting. But you can see this is a shell script, right? That's essentially going to, um, ask the user which cars they like, ask the user to enter some cars, and then basically just print out um, those cars. So it's, it just shows you, you know, how you can get some inputs, how you can print things out and print it, print out, you know, inputs and things like that. So that's just an example of a, of a shell script. And we talked about shell, but that's what it is. But you can see I'm running Debian uh, or Linux on, uh, on Windows. And, um, you know, this is uh, helpful if you want to uh, practice or if you want some experience with Linux. Um, some systems will might actually use the Windows uh, subsystem for Linux um, to do certain things. So it's installed as part of some other piece of software. But, um, you know, for my purpose, I just am using it really for um, uh, testing and, and instruction and things like that. So uh, you can see now it took a couple of minutes, but if I wanted to, I could just um, start it up. So let's see how difficult or easy it is. So it took a few minutes to install. And now it's, or sorry, a few minutes to download. Now it's saying it's going to take a few minutes to install. Um, if it takes five seconds or 10 seconds, we'll let it, otherwise we'll come back to it. And there you go, right? So oh, there are a few more steps. Hit next to continue. Okay. I'm not going to go through this right now. And, uh, uh, it's kind of a, a waste of time. But um, at the break, as I said, if you want, I would recommend you just download Ubuntu. It'll be the fastest one to get you up and running for the hands-on session. So first thing you can do is, um, you know, use it, um, use the Windows, sorry, the Linux subsystem on, on uh, Windows. Um, and then here's another interesting one. So copy.sh. So I'm going to go to this URL. OK, and I'm going to click on this virtual x86. OK, and what you see here is they're offering different operating systems in the browser, which is very interesting. So. Um, You know, you can see even if you wanted to run an older version of Windows, Windows 1.01, 1 .01, <laughs> uh, Windows 98, Windows 2000. But, you know, what we're interested in is some of these Linux distributions. So there's Arch uh, Linux, um, DSL or Damn Small Linux, uh, Build Root Linux. Um, so let's just uh, spin up this Arch Linux here. So, you know, pretty quick, um, you know, and then you have some things that you can do up here on the top menu. But if I look at it, you, know, you run this command and it takes a long time. Wow. But you can see that I am not, whereas before when I was in Ubuntu, I was on my own file system, right? I'm looking at my own files. Um, 
through Linux. Whereas here, I don't know whose files I'm looking at exactly. I don't know if this is shared or what, um, but I'm looking at, um, or maybe these are just the, uh, the files that are installed as part of the, the uh, copy that it makes, but this is somebody else's file system. But it's just a way if you if you want to get access to, to Linux uh, and you want to take a look at um, you know, certain commands or how some things work, you can use this as another uh, alternative. Okay, uh, linuxzoo.net. Let's check out linuxzoo.net. Okay, so linuxzoo.net, um, again, they have um, a few different options. I haven't done this. Um, you know, you're free to, to do it if you'd like, but you can create an account here. And once you create an account, you can essentially, uh, in here, here it says there's zero, uh, zero users ahead of the queue, but you can basically um, get in a queue to use a uh, Linux console. Okay. So these ones are obviously a little bit more um, complex than um, what I showed you before with uh, doing it on Windows, but um, they exist. Here's the other one I want to show you. This does not, I don't have a link here, so virtual bar. Virtualbox.org. Okay. Right, so here you have um, different platforms um, uh, for Oracle VM. Uh, and so if you have uh, Oracle VirtualBox, this is something you can, you know, you can run Again, Linux distribution. So if I go to Linux, uh, you can see all the different uh, Linux distributions that it supports. Okay. And um, you were asking me about um, packages, uh, package managers. So here is the package manager for uh, Fedora and Red Hat, the Fedora and Red Hat family. So, you know, this would, um, do an install for you. Okay. Um, let me go back to my main slides here. So, you know, those are a few ways to uh, to go in and, and, and try Linux if you want. Um, the next section I was actually planning to do after the break, we can get started if, um, start early if we want. But I wanted to just show, somebody asked about the um, package manager. So this is Ubuntu. So uh, Ubuntu get, okay, so app get is the package managers, package manager. So you can see when I type app get, you can see it's giving you the, um, the usage, how would you use it. And so for example, if I wanted to update all the existing packages, I would just do that. So app get, if I do apt get, app get update. Okay, I have, yeah, we'll have to, we'll talk about um, uh, user permissions and so on next time, but I have to be root to do this. So I'm going to switch to the root user. Okay, and then I'm going to do apt get update. And now you can see it's updating all of the packages. It's gonna take a while, but uh, you can see it's got some security packages. Um, And it's done, okay? So there are other uh, other things you can install. Um, so we talked about Apache, right? apt get httpd. Let's see if that's gonna work. No. Yeah, I'm more familiar with the yum, but just let me check something here. apt get, and then you can, 
install. If not, then we'll switch over to the commands and I'll check this for you after, do for you after the break. But I can do app kit install HTTPD. Okay, so it, in fact, looks like it, it did install, but it's giving me an error here. But you can see this is essentially when we talk about a package manager, I'm installing HTTPD and that's the Apache web server, which I talked about before. Um, so it's giving you uh, all the, the possible candidates and telling me that I need to install one of these by, by default. So I'm not gonna do that right now because like I said, I'm more familiar with Yum, um, but this kind of gives you a sense of what the, what the package manager does. All right, so we, we have about eight minutes left before the break, so I will start the um, hands-on portion of it um, right now. If you have not already done so and you want to, then like I said, feel free to download this Ubuntu um, distro from the, the Microsoft Windows Store if that's what you have, all right? So what I have here are, um, slides but i'm gonna i'm gonna toggle back and forth between the slides and my terminal because it's going to be kind of boring to just watch um slides uh of commands so let me do a little bit of background and then um i'll start working on the on the slide uh sorry i'll, I'll switch between the slides and the and the console um so you can see what actually happens and we can you know, try a few different things as opposed to what's just uh, on the screen. Okay, so let's talk about um, the shell. What is what is the shell? Um, I'm sure there's a there's a shell somewhere on this call, um, but a shell is a program that's going to receive the user's commands and gives them to the operating system and displays the output. Okay, so. You remember when we talked about the operating system, we had all of these different components. So one was, you know, something that was processing the inputs, um, and the shell is kind of that first layer of applications that exists as part of the operating system, right? So it's if you look at this this pig, picture here, you can see it's at the same level of the application. It's taking input from the user. Um, it's going to process it. Right, the application, this shell has to be able to process it um, um, and then sends it to the Linux kernel to do whatever it needs to do. Um, and then you're gonna get your response back. Now, one of the most uh, common shells um, is the born again shell. And again, it's born spelt like this after the person who created it um, is uh, an enhanced version of uh, Steve Bourne's first Unix shell. Um, and if you look at most Linux systems, they're running um, Bash. And you'll hear about Bash scripts and you know, lots of different variants of, of, of um, uh, Bash and, and shell, but most common uh, kind of vanilla, um, you know, quite ubiquitous is going to be uh, the Bash shell. So think of it as, this, you know, in, in, in the most simple way, this is the shell, right? It's a, a um, uh, this is your interface almost, but uh, it's the interface to the shell, to your uh, your ability to, to, to exchange commands with the operating system and the kernel, and to be able to get the computer to do something useful. Okay. Um, so, when you look at the, the Linux shell, um, you know, I showed you those scripts, right? And those scripts allow you to create essentially a, a, a program. You know, when you write a script, you give it a set of instructions. And again, like I said, if we have some time towards the end, we'll write some short scripts, but you give it a set of instructions. And then those instructions are executed uh, by the kernel. Um, but at the same time, I can just go in and I can type a command right here. Right. So actually, if I go back to my like that, I'm just typing a command. LS means show me all the files in this directory, list the directory. Right. Or I can. Um, run this command. Right. And it's asking me which cars do you like? So I can say Honda. 
Toyota, uh, whatever, Kia, right? You like Honda and you like Toyota and you like Kia. So this is a program. So I, you know, a very simple one, obviously, and it's written using um, uh, uh, Bash shell, a Bash script, um, but it's a program. So the shell acts both as a command line interpreter at the command line, you can type something, it'll interpret it and do something and return it to you, or you can use it as a programming uh, language. So it acts as both, that's what that means. Then as you can see, the command prompt generally shows the current user, um, uh, the host and the appropriate directory, right? So you can see the current user, uh, the host. So the current user is Altaz here, that's me. And then the, host, that's the name of my host or my desktop. And then the current directory, this this thing here, which you see um, beside your one, typically on your keyboard, shift right beside your one, it's called tilde. Uh, the current directory is tilde, that's my home directory. Whenever you wanna go home, um, var, log, whatever, I, I'm in some directory. If I wanna go home, I just do uh, cd tilde and I'm back in my, home directory, okay? So if I do CD, um, again, var log, you'll see it's showing you again, the user, um, the host, and then the directory, followed by the prompt, uh, followed by the dollar sign. And you can um, see that prompt, I think it's PS1, yeah. So it's a little bit cryptic, uh, but this, this thing here defines your prompt. It's a little bit long-winded, but some of this stuff is actually setting the color here to green, and some of this is setting the color here to blue. Um, and then you can see some of it um, is setting the host name, the user. So here's the user at host. So you can change this default prompt if you wanted to and make it anything you want. So if you knew how to actually, um, you could figure out what all of these things mean and change the color, change, you know, however it's structured, whatever you want. And a lot of people do that if you want your own custom uh, prompt, okay? Um, and then if you look at the, the, the last symbol, the dollar sign that, that tells you that you're the just a regular user, um, not a privileged user. If I switch to this root user, this is how you switch to the root user. Now all of a sudden you see, not only does it give me the root name, root user name, but you can see I am, it switches the prompt to this dollar sign telling me that I am root, okay? All right, we are at 8.45. Uh, that means time for another break. Um, so why don't you get a drink, whatever you need to do, and I will see you back here uh, at nine for a little bit more of the hands-on. All right, and we'll get started in just another minute here or less. All right. Okay. So yeah, the the uh, session actually ends at nine forty-five. I thought it was ten, but I just double checked. It's nine forty-five. So we have another forty-five minutes to go. Um, so let us make the most of it. Um, you were. Uh, yeah. So we had the we talked about the man the. Uh, the last, the, the prompt at the end, right? So whenever it's the hash, um, you are root. And if it's not, then you're not, yeah. All right. Um, okay, yeah, and we talked about this. Um, you can see it here in this particular on this particular screen capture, the username, the host name, um, and then the current directory. 
uh, which we saw on the Ubuntu shell as well. Were many of you able to uh, to um, download Linux? You can just put a quick message in the in the chat if you did. I'm just interested in know how many anybody downloaded it, or you can just anybody, nobody, everybody. Okay, all right. Well, hopefully some of you got to, to download it. If you have any questions about that, let me know. Um, so let's start with some of these uh, basic commands. Okay, so we're gonna start with the uh, listing the directory. So if you're in Windows, uh, you're probably used to the DIR command. So first I'm gonna switch back to my home directory. Well, first I'm gonna make my user back to, or, or res, uh, um, exit from being the root user. And then I'm gonna switch back to my home directory, okay? So if I just do ls, okay, you can see it lists the directories, um, or it lists the directory uh, horizontally. And you can see it, it lists the directory um, and color codes it. So all of these blue uh, lists or blue items here are uh, directories and all of these green items here are files. So let's say I wanted to look at the directory um, uh, in a different way. I wanted to look at it uh, long, uh, lengthwise or make it longer with all the details. So that's ls dash L, okay, that's a kind of an important one to remember. Uh, and you probably could use it all, a lot, um, you know, quite a bit of the time. And then the other uh, short form for ls dash L, often there's an alias in the system. If you just type LL, um, it will give you the same thing. Well, actually, it's slightly different. So let me go back to that. So ls minus L is just going to give you the, um, the details. So the details are the permissions. And during the next uh, session, the boot, boot camp session, we'll talk about permissions. Um, and then you've got the, um, uh, the owners, the owner of the file, um, size, in this case, the directory doesn't matter, the time, okay? That was last modified and then the name of the file. Okay. So that's if I just do ls minus L. So ls gives me, so again, ls just prints everything horizontally. If I do ls minus L, it prints it with, with the details. Now, if I wanna see the hidden files, so ls, ls minus L, okay. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, right? 15 items. Now, if I do LS minus LA, okay, you can see there's a lot more than 15. Here are the 15 items. But in addition, all of these other files that start with dot, these are all hidden files. Okay, so by doing ls minus la, I'm able to see hidden files. And sometimes you wanna see those hidden files. So for example, um, this file um, is important in configuring how your system starts up. And so, you know, you want to um, make sure it's there. And if you were to do just an ls or just an ls minus l, you're not gonna know that it's there. You're not gonna see it. So if you wanna see hidden files, you do ls minus la, and that's in fact what the ll um, alias is there for. So that lists that's um, if you do ls, if you do ll, that's the same as ls minus la. Okay, so basic um, directory function, like I said in, in Windows, the uh, um, equivalent would be dir. Okay, so you got ls, ls minus l. Um, all right, so let's talk about um, directories and changing directories, right? Um, so hopefully most of you know that your 
um, file system is organized in files and directories, right? So if I if I just do a, a ls minus l here, okay, I've got uh, files, right, and then I've got directories. So how do I how do I move from one directory to the other? Well, um, if I want to if I want to um, go down in my uh, directories, so I can you know cd old okay, cd old put the slash if you want you don't have to and now I'm going to look at the files in this directory and you know there's a bunch of files in this directory as well no more folders okay. um, if I want to go back up how do I go back up anybody know dot dot yeah cd space dot dot is going to take me back up always no matter where you are if you want to go up cd dot cd space dot dot okay and the other tip that i have for you is um and this works sometimes well not sometimes it works with windows as well but you don't have to type the whole the whole um word for the whole uh, file name or whole directory. So if I do ls minus l, let's say I want to go to this folder. I don't want to type this whole folder name in. So with Linux, what you can do is you can use the tab. Now, I, 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 you can't see me using the tab, but you'll see how quickly it comes up. So I'm going to do cd, and then I'm going to do con. That's it. And then I press tab. and it takes me to, it fills in as much as it can because it knows this starts with condition and this starts with condition. So it doesn't know if I want to go here or here. So it just stops at condition. And then I'm just going to put AL tab and it takes me to conditional statements. And now if I do LS minus L, you can see I'm here. Now if I want to go down again, I can do CD space. Now I'm going to just do F. Okay. And as soon as I press F, it gives me the folder. Why is that? Because there's still another entry here with F and another entry here with F. How did it know that I want folder and not file operation operators or file? How did it know I want this before it didn't know? How is it so smart this time? The reason it was so smart is because when I type CD, it knows that the next parameter that comes after CD has to be a folder. It cannot be a file. So that means this is not a candidate. This is not a candidate. The only thing that's a candidate is this. So as soon as I do CDF tab, I go down to the next folder. Okay. If I want to go up, what do I do? I do cd space dash, or sorry, dot dot. And I want to go up again in one statement. So I just do this dot dot again. So now this is going to take me back here and back here. I'm going to, to, to do, do two jumps at once. Um, so, uh, as I was saying to you before, this tilde is your home directory. So, let's just go to some random directory. But well, let's go to cd slash. Okay, this is where a lot of the system files are. So, if I do cd slash home, okay, you see all the home directories there. And if I do CD, 
right? So what I'm trying to say is that your home folder, if I wanted to go home, I can do one of two things. One, let's go again into some random folder here, var logs. Okay, so I'm in the var logs folder and I wanna go home. How do I go home? I can either do cd tilde, I look at, well, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but to look at the uh, present working directory is pwd, and it tells me what the present working directory is. That's tilde. So you can see to go home, I have two options. The other option I have, again, if I'm back in my var log, if I want to go home, I do home, altas, and I'm back at the same place. Okay. So even if you don't know, because sometimes this will be home and then your username, but not always the case. Some systems might be configured different. So if you want to go just, if you want to go home, you don't know what it's set or, or how it's configured, you just do CD tilde and that's what it will take you. Okay. And then um, the other thing, which is not very helpful, but um, it's in the slide. So let me just explain it to you. It, oh, sorry, it's not CD slash. Yeah. Okay. So we did that one. Never mind. Never mind what I just said. Uh, so again, CD slash, that's the uh, root. Right? That's where kind of everything is built off of. So you have the home directory, then you've got all the bin where all the executables are, and you know, um, essentially everything is built off, uh, built from here. That's kind of the, the root. It's like when you go to C colon backslash in Windows, that's what this is, it's the root. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so how did those directories get there? So let's go back home. How did these directories get there in the first place? Well, they got there by me making them. And you make a directory by doing, uh, by the, with the command mkdir, make directory, okay? So mkdir, I'm gonna call this directory bootcamp uh, one. If I do ls minus l, you can see bootcamp one is there. Okay. So now I can go into that directory. There's no files there. So it's just saying zero files. Okay, so you can make directories. Yeah. If I wanted to go back up, I'm going to go up. If I want to remove that directory, delete the directory, it's rmdir. So make directory is mk for make directory. Remove directory is rm for remove, followed by dir for directory. And I'm going to say remove directory bootcamp. Oops. And it's gone. And once it's gone, it's gone. You can um, recreate it, recreate it with the same name. Um, there's no no mem no memory, no history like that. MKDIR bootcamp one. Now I'm going to go to bootcamp one. I'm going to do something. Uh, I'm going to create a file. So there's lots of ways to create a file. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run this command called touch. Touch creates a zero byte file, it's an empty file. Okay, so I'm just going to call it uh, file1.txt. Okay, there's nothing in it. So if you look at it, it's zero bytes, but it's a file. Now I'm going to go back up and I'm going to remove directory. Okay. So you see, you're not allowed to remove 
directories uh, yeah, that a directory that's not empty. Okay, but I could force it. I could tell it that uh, it doesn't matter if it's empty or not. But this is kind of a safety precaution um, that's built into the the command because you know you might try and delete a directory and there's a lot of files in there and uh, to protect you from doing something silly. But I can force it. I can say rmdir and then I'm going to say dash f for force. So force the removal even if it's empty. I mean even if it's not empty. And boot camp one. Huh. Why did that happen? Is it Debian? Okay. One sec. Okay, this one is asking for ignore fail on empty. Okay. I've never seen that one before, but I guess you can use that. To type. Yeah. Anyways, on, on Red Hat, I don't have Red Hat here, but uh, if you're running Red Hat, you just do rmdir slash f and it would delete it even if it's not empty. Okay. Um, okay. So that's the, that's how I make a directory. That's how I remove a directory. Okay. Um, okay, we, we talked about this, remove a, um, removing the directory. Okay, so PWD is uh, show the present working directory. That's how I remember PWD or, or the current path. But uh, yeah, wherever you are, PWD uh, shows you where you are. So CD var, Love. Right. So even though it's it is here, um, again, if somebody had changed the prompt and you don't necessarily have it here because they, you could do that, then you know that's going to get you um, uh, the current directory. Okay. All right, so we did uh, touch already. Actually, touch is going to create a um, a file, a zero byte file, and so you can then, you know, you can do lots of things with it. Um, you can edit it, or maybe you just need to, you know, have a file there, so you have a file in the directory, but it will just create a zero byte file for you. Okay. Um, oh, that's what I did wrong. Okay, sorry. Where my head is right now. Okay, it should be removed. If I do that, it should work. Yeah. So I cannot remove the directory, and I, I was using the wrong command. It's not rm um, dir, it's just rm, and then minus r means recursive, and f means force, and that will allow me to delete a directory that's not empty. Okay, that's what I was trying to show you before. So now if I look at it, uh, that directory is gone. Um, but RM generally is for removing a file. So <clears throat> I make a file um, or create a file. Let's just make a, I'll take a copy of an existing file. So test.sh to my new file.txt. So if I do this, now here's my new file.txt. Okay. So if I want to delete it, rm or remove my new file. 
and it should no longer be there. And with any of these commands, like I showed you before, or like I did before, if you want to know what the um, uh, options are, you can do the, you can use help. And I think we have a session, I think either in the second Linux class or the third one, we'll go through, you know, how to use the man pages and the help pages. But if you do this, you get dash dash help, you get all the, so here I typed rm dash dash help, space dash dash help. So it tells you what do you have to do to, how do you use it? So you have rm and then you have some options and then you have the file name, right? So here are the options you have uh, dash f, uh, dash i will prompt you, right? So rather than uh, just deleting it, it'll ask you if you want it to delete. Um, Recursive, so that's going to remove directories. Um, if you have, uh, you know, nested directories, folder one, folder two, folder three, and you use that R, um, it will remove their, uh, uh, remove it uh, recursively. And then you have uh, remove empty directories and verbose, it will explain what it's doing. So let's try that. Okay, let me do uh, again. Copy test.sh to my new file. Okay, so I'm going to do rm my text. Okay, so that gives you. An output of um, what it did. Okay. And, you know, it may not always be necessary when you're at the command line to um, use verbose, but sometimes when you're trying to, you know, when you're writing a script and you're debugging a script, um, that's when these this will come handy because come in handy because you want to know that it actually uh, completed that particular operation or you want to know if there was an error or something like that, but the, the verbose flag will um, will help with that. Okay, we can even try that same flag. Let's do copy test.sh to my new file.txt. Let's try the verbose flag, right? And again, it tells you what it, what it does. So this is kind of a, a um, generic flag that you can use for uh, different commands. So where's the recycling bin? Right, I'm in Windows and I delete a file. I just go to the recycling bin and right click and restore and I get my file back. Where's the recycling bin? Whoever said nowhere is right. Nowhere. There's no recycling bin. Once you delete it, it's gone. So you have to be a little bit more careful. Okay, so we have uh, copy, right? So copy, there's a couple of different um, couple of things that we can do. So let's let's do this first. So I showed you how to copy from one, so while you're just in one directory, right? If I'm just in one directory, I want to copy a file from, uh, from uh, use copy a file and just call it something else. I just do copy um, test.sh to test2.sh. Okay, so the other thing you can do is, um, copy from another directory to where you are now. So I can do CP for copy, and I'm going to copy, let's say, a, a log file. So far log, what else what do we have there? Um, let's just say alternatives, okay? So I'm gonna uh, copy 
var log. And let's see alternative. So this is the file I'm copying. This is the source. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy it here. So this dot means here. So I'm just going to do here now if I you can see it copy the file here to this folder. Now what if I wanted to uh, what if I wanted to copy it and name it to some, name it something else? So I'm gonna do dot so dot forward slash the current directory. Okay. That's here. That's the current directory, which you have to specify. Um, new alternatives. Okay. So now I've got, I've copied the file from somewhere else to here, but I've given it a new name. Okay. So if I want to specify a new name, I do here, current directory, and then the name. If I just want to copy it here with the same name, I just do a dot. Okay. Uh, so we copied from a different directory to this directory. I can also copy from this directory to another directory, right? So if I want to do a copy, and I'm going to say new alternatives.log, and I'm going to say, um, var log okay so if i do this what will the what will the new what will the name of the file be in the var log folder it will just be new alternatives.log if i wanted to call it something else copy alternatives Let's call it my new file. Okay, I don't have permission to copy it. Yeah, so I don't have permission, but um, normally if I did, uh, then it would, well, I can copy it somewhere else. I can just say copy new alternatives. Let's call it, copy it there. I don't know if I'll be able to do that either. No. Okay. So, but anyways, if I wanted to copy it to a different location from here, that's what you would do. Okay. So there's copying. The other thing you can do is you can um, you can move files. So sometimes you don't want to copy files, though, but you want to move them, right? So let's say I want to take this file that I just copied and I want to move it somewhere else. Okay, I copied it here and I realize, oh, it's in the wrong place. So I'm going to do move or, or MV for move, alternatives.log. And now I have to move it to a different, well, one thing I could do is I could just rename it. Okay, so you, MV also works as rename. So I'm going to call it um, a new file. Log. Okay, so move just renamed it, but I could also move it to another directory. So I'm going to move the new file to condition conditions. If I go to conditions, you can see that file is there. Okay, so MV will move the file, um, delete it from where it is now, and put it where you ask it to put it. And copy is just going to uh, take a copy of it. Okay. Oh, okay, that was the next one, MV. 
cat. So this is a this is a pretty important one. So cat is going to show you the contents of a file. So I just want to see what oops. I just want to see what's in in a file. All I need to do is cat it. So uh, cat my list sh, and it will spill out the contents of the file. I have a long file here. Yeah, so you see this is this is a longer file, right? So if you have a longer file and you want to um, be able to, to read it rather than having to scroll by, you can just do cat and then you uh, put a pipe. This is a this is the this vertical bar, and you pipe it through more. And now you can see you've got this uh, more label or this more prompt. And essentially, if you want to continue, you can um, press the space, and then it'll go to the next spot. Okay, so it gives you an opportunity to read the file without it scrolling all the way down. Okay, but cat is the important thing to remember here, it's going to allow you to see the contents of a file. Okay, any questions so far? No questions, anything look exciting, interesting, not interesting? Okay, all right, Echo. Uh, so Echo will, um, will send the output to screen or file. So, it's pretty easy. Echo, hello. It will say hello. Um, there are also, I wonder if we should, um, yeah. So you can see I did echo hello. I could do echo hello. Just look at hello. I could do echo hello. Echo hello. The difference between the no quotes, double quotes, and single quotes. Um, I think we might go into it at um, in a different lesson. But they actually, uh, we, if it's just text, it doesn't really matter. Um, but when they're special characters, um, it will matter. Okay. And so um, the single quote and the double quote act a little bit differently. So for example, uh, the double quotes is one of those special characters. So if I wanted to do, if I wanted to actually say hello in quotes, right? Can I do this? What about, right? So by putting the single quote, I'm telling it that you know these quotes need to be not shouldn't be ignored. Okay, so and, and I think we'll do quotations um, uh, in another lesson as well. But echo whatever you whatever you put after it, that's exactly what it uh, spits out for you. Okay. But the other way to the other way to use echo is to use it with a redirect, and, and a redirect in Linux is that or that. Okay, so let me show you the difference between the two. So, um, so I'm going to say echo hello to. Yeah. Okay, so here's my bootcamp.txt. And you see it's not a it's not a zero byte file, it's got six bytes. So let's look at it. How do I look at it? How do I look at what's inside the file? 
cat. 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 Correct. So I'm going to do cat my bootcamp.txt and it says hello. Okay. Now I want to say goodbye. So I'm going to say echo. Oh, sorry. Echo goodbye. And I'm going to redirect it to my bootcamp.txt. Okay, now let's look at my bootcamp. Oh, wait a minute. I wanted to say hello and goodbye. Okay, let's do that again. So I'm going to start with echo hello my bootcamp. Okay, my yeah. Hello. What I want is I want it to say hello, goodbye. So now I'm just going to do echo, goodbye, my boot, and .txt. Now I'm going to add file, and I get both. Okay. So you see the difference between the two? So this one will essentially delete the contents and echo this into an empty file. This one will keep the contents there um, and echo that value into the file. So this is helpful if you know, you've got any sort of files and you're trying to keep information in a file um, if you don't care what was in there before, you could do this kind of a redirection. Otherwise, you would use that kind of a redirection. Um, and then you could do interesting things like Right. So now what I did is I listed the contents of the file, but rather than having it print out on the screen, I just redirected it to this other file. And so I can do it again. This time I'm going to use the double redirect. Now is listed twice. Okay. Okay, so that's the um, echo command. Very helpful in you know any sort of um, any sort of uh, anytime you need to print something out, or like I said, if you want to. Um, put information into a file, okay? All right. Um, so this is important uh, to note that, you know, uh, Linux is gonna be case, is case sensitive. All right, so um, we can just show that here. Um, echo. File. Let's do what we did before. A.txt. Echo. Old file. Put that out to A.txt. You can see I've got two different files. So, you know, it's going to be case sensitive, and so you have to be. Um, you have to be careful with that, right? Even variables, we haven't got into, um, yeah, I don't think we're doing uh, variables today, but 
um, you know, I can I can create variables in Linux. Um, like for example, the path tells me all the different directories that it searches for programs. Okay. Um, but if I do echo uh, is not the same thing. Okay. So whenever you're you're um, creating variables, whenever you're creating files, whenever you're doing anything, uh, just keep in mind that uh, case matters. Okay, the last thing is um, globbing. Okay, um, so when you're looking for patterns um, in a particular file or in a particular directory, okay, so let's see here. Um, you've got the, the single character match. So so I can do ls 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 minus l. Right. So basically, what I've said to it, what I've said is list all the list all the files that look like this dead one character and then sh okay or i can do a wild card i can say ls minus l and i'm going to say dead uh, let's say dea star so now it's not just trying to match one character now it's trying to match as many characters as it can on this side of it. Okay. And this works for this ls command, but it also works for um, uh, for other commands. And you know, when you're doing searches, um, you can remove files, you can do rm uh, e -A star. Okay. You might have to use a dash F, but you can do that. Okay. And then you can do uh, matching characters from a range. Okay. So if I want to say, um, what's a good example here? So actually, I don't know if this will work, but let me try. Uh, D E A. T. Yeah, I don't know if this is going to work. No, because there's too many characters here. Um, but basically, you can say, uh, well, let's let's try this. Uh, A to D. Right. So this is saying, show me all the files that have characters A through D as the first character, and then EAD.sh. SH. So there's only one of those, but if there were others, right? And then I did this, then I get both of them. Okay. All right. There's a few more which we can um, continue with during the next session. I think the next uh, boot camp session is next Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I look forward to seeing you then. Uh, are there any questions, uh, anything that needs clarification before we um, complete, but we'll continue with the last few of these at the next session. Any questions, comments? Okay. All right, well, everybody have a great evening and we'll see you at the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.